Namaste and greetings. I, Subia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all at hashtag IMPRI Web Policy Talk. Today, on the occasion of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, India at the rate 75, we are gathered for a special deliberation on the topic the State of School Education in India by Professor Muchkan Dube. This deliberation is a part of the State of Education, hashtag Education Dialogue Series, organized by the IMPRI Center for ICT for Development. As the chair for the session, we have Professor Janthiala B.G. Tilak, ICSSR National Fellow, Distinguished Professor, Council for Social Development, New Delhi, former professor and vice chancellor, National University of Educational Planning and Administration. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jibia. With permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the gathering. We are elated to welcome the keynote speaker for today's talk, Professor Muchkun Dube. Professor Muchkun Dube, currently president of the Council for Social Development, New Delhi, has master's degree in economics from Patna University and has studied economics in Oxford and New York universities. He has a D.Lit degree honoris causa from the University of Calcutta. He started his career as a lecturer in economics and later joined the Indian Foreign Service. He served as the High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh and the permanent representative of India to UN organizations in Geneva. He also worked as an international civil servant in the UN and UNDP for five years. He retired from the Foreign Service after serving as the Foreign Secretary to the Government of India. He then joined the Jawaharlal Nehru University as professor, where he taught for close to eight years. He was the Indian member of the Executive Board of UNESCO, Chairman of the Common School System Commission Bihar, and the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of Sikkim. Professor Dube has written a large number of papers, chapters of books, and articles on international security and disarmament matters, international development cooperation, world order issues, and social and economic development in India. He has edited three books, including Indian Society Today, Challenges of Equality, Integration, and Empowerment, co-edited six books and is the author of three books, Unequal Treaty, World Trading Order after GATT 1966, India's Foreign Policy, Coping with the Changing World 2013, and Lallan Shah Fakir Ke Geet 2017. We welcome you, sir. Okay. We are joined by esteemed discussants, Professor Poonam Batra, Professor of Education, co-investigator, TESF India, formerly with Central Institute of Education, University of Delhi. We welcome you, ma'am. We'd also like to welcome Dr. Manish Jain, Associate Professor, School of Education Studies, Ambedkar University, Delhi. We welcome you, sir. As the moderator for today's session, we have Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI. Now, I invite Dr. Simi Mehta to initiate the deliberation. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Zubia. And a very warm and good evening to one and all. It is a proud moment and proud moment and great honor and privilege for us at IMPRI to be hosting today's web policy talk under the series, The State of Education, Hashtag Education Dialogue, especially when we are celebrating India at, 27, 40, uh, India at 75, Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. Um, it is our proud privilege that the keynote speaker is none other than the globally renowned, globally celebrated scholar of education, Professor Mujkun Dube. Thank you so much, sir, for your consent to deliver this lecture. And equally, we are so grateful to Professor JBG Tilak for chairing this session and also to Professor Poonam Batra, Dr. Manish Jain, and also to Dr. Haim Borkar. Thank you all. 
So uh, we are all aware that uh, treating school education in a holistic manner and improving school effectiveness in terms of equal opportunities for schooling and learning outcomes has been the aspiration of all, from parents to learners, from policymakers to practitioners alike. So added also to this is the moral responsibility to instill values, ethics, and morals, as well as to nurture the children to become leaders in their respective careers that they also they would want to opt for in future. So what are the challenges in school education in India at the teaching, learning, the pedagogical levels? What are the best practices from different parts of the country or even abroad, which can be emulated, which can be generalized, keeping in mind India's uniqueness and also the ways forward for ensuring a smart, aspirational, responsible, empathetic and wise children who on whose shoulders the um, greatness of India rests upon. So to discuss all these issues and also beyond, we are so grateful to all our panelists, distinguished panelists, and I welcome all of you. I also welcome all the participants here on Zoom and also those who are watching us live on Facebook. Please sit back and enjoy and also learn from this esteemed panel of experts. I would not take much time between you and Professor Dube and I would request Professor JBG Tilak to start the session. Professor Tilak, over to you. So Thank please you. unmute. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Simi Mehta. Uh, good evening to everyone. <clears throat> I indeed feel it a privilege and an honor uh, to chair this session of the Education Dialogue in which uh, a very, very distinguished expert in education, uh, a strong a person who has a strong commitment to education, and in fact, championed and is fighting for the cause of education, Professor Mukhtar Dubey. I think I don't find anybody better than person, better than Professor Dubey to speak on this on this particular issue of school education in India, on which uh, he was doing for, he was working for quite some time. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, the Impri team, Arjun Kumar and his team, for giving me this opportunity to chat. Uh, when it comes to education, particularly in school education, I think one can say that many things are happening now. But I also remember what Jordan Robinson said, uh, whatever you say about India is true, and the converse is also equally true. So some people can easily say that perhaps nothing substantial is happening, and that's also true perhaps. Uh, at least but after the Right to Education Act was made, some activities are going on with some with high speed and some with low speed, some in positive directions and some in not necessarily in positive directions. And the NEP National Education Policy 20 has made further Philip to take up some more activities. What we simply find is enrollments are increasing in elementary education, primary education and, and upper primary. Enrollment ratios are also increasing both gross enrollment ratios and net enrollment ratios. The net enrollment ratio in elementary education, according to the official statistics, is beyond six, higher than 90%, so close to 100%, based on which we tend to say that, yes, universalization of elementary education is complete, is a completed task. But perhaps that's not true. Uh, there are several things which are still to be done if we want to sincerely say that uh, elementary education is, is nearly, is completely universalized. <clears throat> While there are many, I think what we find is the quality of education is one which is uh, at a depressingly low level in almost uh, the entire country. <clears throat> whether they are rural schools or urban schools or whether they are boys or girls or marginalized or others. And it's unfortunately, there is no strong evidence to show that there is any improvement uh, with respect to levels of learning of the children over the years. What are happening in our days is, of course, we are talking a lot. The Sarvasiksha Abhiyan, uh, which was launched uh, in the beginning of its present century, is uh, integrated into secondary education, secondary education, vocational education, and teacher education. And we have Samagra Siksha Abhiyan now. And we have to still see how effectively it will deliver uh, in, in terms of uh, achievements on school education, the goals that we have. We also have tentative goals of universal secondary education along with universal elementary education. But we find very serious problem of teacher shortage, which is an important reason for perhaps the low quality of education, low levels of learning. The training of teachers is uh, in fact is an issue. 
which has to be taken uh, in a much more serious way than is being taken. We are also talking about school planning and there are certain measures that are being taken up <clears throat> uh, with good intentions of, of mergers of schools, closures of schools, saying that there are very small, untiny schools, uh, uh, tiny schools in a large number of areas, unviable schools. Now, whether the measures and closures and the school planning models that we are talking about will improve the access to education or will have an adverse effect on the access? Will it really improve the efficiency and quality of education? We have to still see. And what we also note that public expenditures on education, school education or the entire education or have not significantly increased <clears throat> over the years. Uh, in fact, for some years, you find relative proportions have declined as uh, a proportion of national income or as a proportion of total government expenditure, both at the center and state levels. The national education policy, about which I think the prime minister, the education minister, and the entire country are speaking about, uh, <clears throat> includes some serious actions. I think some implementation is already being done our implementation efforts are being made. <clears throat> Still, we are talking about foundational, in fact, restructuring of the whole school system uh, with foundational literacy, taking grades from one level to the other. Uh, so how far this restructuring the school system, again, would be an efficient proposal and would promote uh, enrollments, would promote quality and would promote equity in education. We have to still see. We're also talking about curricular reforms. We're talking about recruitment of teachers and the training of teachers. And at the same time, we're also talking about modifications in the Right to Education Act, or some modifications are already being made. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, how far they are good for the education system, we have to still see. In fact, many of these proposals have both, in my view, have both uh, plus and negative points, and we have to be really very critical about them. And particularly when we are implementing them, even though I don't question the intentions, the intentions are noble, but I think uh, we have to be worried about the likely adverse effects of some of these measures. Um, but certainly, okay, I will not take much time, but we have really a very distinguished expert to speak, followed by a very eminent panel of experts uh, as panelists. <clears throat> so let me stop here, and the time schedule, etc., everything is given. Now I'll uh, give the floor to Professor Gutsch, who's going to debate. Professor Dubey. Thank you, Professor Tilak. Uh, thank you, Professor Gutsch, for It's so nice to be in the midst of the colleagues uh, with whom I have been working in the field of uh, school education over the past few decades. Uh, I think uh, one person here who is uh, really globally recognized as an expert in education is Professor Tilak and not, not me. And uh, there is no, no doubt about that. And there are others uh, who have devoted their uh, uh, whole time of their career to pursuing the subject, working on projects. And this includes a very distinguished uh, Professor Mulam Batra, uh, Manish, and now the, in the younger generation, uh, him. Uh, uh, I have, as uh, Professor Tilak pointed out, uh, uh, the commitment uh, uh, to this uh, subject, uh, mainly because I think that uh, uh, without uh, providing uh, a universal quality education to all its uh, citizens, which is implied in universal, uh, our country cannot progress. We can go on, uh, with every project, we can go on saying that this is the world class and this is the world's best uh, but uh, uh, this doesn't uh, uh, grapple with uh, the re reality of the ground. Uh, and uh, that is uh, how educated your people are. And in the realm of education, uh, school education occupies the primary position. There is no doubt about that. That is the main reason why I have devoted uh, over the last 25, 30 years uh, myself to promoting this objective. And uh, this is my main qualification to speak uh, on these subjects. Uh, uh, my sheer commitment 
to the objective of universalizing school education, quality school education. Now, I will, before coming to that, I will take you uh, back uh, uh, in the past, uh, uh, immediately after independence, uh, or a few years before that, the uh, condition of school education in India was very poor. And we can all say it on the basis of our own experience. Uh, the school to which I uh, went, the high school, uh, had a, a radius of 15 kilometers within which there was no other school than that one. So children uh, came to the school walking 10 to 15 miles each way every day. Uh, because simply because there were no other schools. There were so few schools those days. And I myself used to walk uh, not as unfortunate as the one who were at the extremity of the radius of uh, that radius. But I was uh, closer for four miles. Uh, I used to walk. But I had uh, friends who used to join me at my place to walk the last leg of the journey of four miles who came from 10 to 15 miles. Uh, so that was a condition uh, at that time. Uh, literacy rate was very low, uh, almost 10% uh, or so at that time. Uh, then came independence. And the trust, famous trust with destiny speech, which Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru delivered uh, on the eve of the transfer of power uh, in the Constituent Assembly, he committed himself to social development, particularly the development of uh, uh, education and health. And uh, uh, then we adopted a constitution. Uh, there was a strong uh, pressure during the course of the formulation of the constitution to make education a fundamental right. But uh, it was opposed uh, by others on the ground that uh, given the resources position in the country, it was an unrealistic goal. So as a compromise, uh, this uh, objective was put in the directive principles of state policy, which is Article 45 of the Constitution. And it said, and it uh, bears reputation, the state shall endeavor to provide within a period of 10 years, uh, free and compulsory education for all children, for all children until they complete the age of 14 years. There was a provision there. And uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, it seemed that the government uh, was trying to live up to the uh, promise given to the nation in the destiny, trust with destiny speech. And uh, there was a, quite an impressive progress in uh, uh, multiplying the number of schools, multiplying the number of children going to school. Both of them increased uh, many fold during the first uh, uh, decade and a half or two decades uh, after independence. Uh, but in retrospect, uh, one would say that it was a big mistake uh, to have uh, not adopted the goal of uh, universalizing, uh, at least in elementary education, as fundamental right and consign it to the chapter on directive principle. It was a historic error, if I may say so. It was a, a lack of uh, foresight of what uh, uh, a nation where every citizen is educated. And you can't be educated unless you are educated in school. As one of the judgments of uh, the Supreme Court had said about 10 years ago, that you can't have the <clears throat> third, fourth, sixth, and seventh floor of a building without you have the 
foundation and the first and the second floor. Uh, uh, and, and so I think uh, uh, second thing is that uh, the, what the cost that the nation would have incurred in universalizing elementary education, uh, say in 10 years time, beginning from 1950, would have been much, much less than what is the price to be paid for universalizing is today. Actually, that syndrome of uh, no universalization until you have resources has, <laughs> has continued till today and has been uh, a handy argument and instrument uh, for uh, not devoting enough resources to education since the uh, time of independence. I think uh, uh, one of our uh, prime ministers recently and uh, some of uh, the economists who follow his line are still going out saying uh, in speech, in speeches that they deliver from time to time uh, that uh, uh, the additional expenditure on education very much depends upon the rate of growth. And uh, if the rate of growth is high, uh, more income will be yielded in the economy. And then you can uh, you know, siphon resources out of that enhanced income uh, to finance education. Now, this is uh, really an insult uh, to the common intelligence of people. I mean, you uh, it's a matter of piety that you want to attach. And pure and simple thing is that you do not want to attach priority to education in the same way as you do it to uh, maintaining police force, law and order, in uh, uh, providing uh, security, which is also a fundamental fundamental right. Uh, and this fundamental right, you put, you place it at an inferior position. And that's why you don't allow resources. I mean, within the limited resources, uh, I, I mean, we take just the example, I'm not going up to that point, which I will do very shortly. You take the uh, Tapas Bhujubnar Commission report. And uh, uh, the total uh, uh, amount uh, uh, that uh, the uh, and we stage for universalizing education in 10 years time was 13,700 crore rupees. Just imagine. This is the amount which uh, a Tasildar takes as a bribe in the, in the country today. This is an amount which, uh, you know, sort of government regards uh, as trifling and not worth the payment of attention at a serious level. And that was the amount per annum of additional resources that was required over 10 years period. If the government in power between the Tapas Muzuzar Committee and 10 years thereafter would have accepted his recommendation, they would have had a universal free and primary education with the minimum norms, because the Tapas Muzuzar Commission was one of the first who prescribed norms. And we calculated the total cost on the basis of putting a price tag on the norms. And uh, that was not implemented. And uh, now today, uh, we come across staggering figure uh, you know, as to how uh, this can be done. So I think, uh, as I pointed out, that uh, uh, that was uh, uh, a wrong policy and uh, that uh, reflected uh, uh, the elitist character of the government that we had at the time. And we are going, uh, we have gone on having since then. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it was the time when a common school system for India should have been adopted. As every country which had the aspiration to be developed to be strong economically has adopted in the world. And India had, a, after independence, a glorious opportunity 
of adopting a common school system. And that should have been done in at the time of the adoption of the constitution. But that was unfortunately uh, not done. Uh, as I pointed out that this syndrome has uh, continued and uh, uh, now uh, not only that, but uh, the commitment that we made in the Right to Education Act to universalize, there is now an attempt to wriggle out of uh, that commitment also. Uh, I will come to that also very shortly. Uh, I think that uh, our uh, uh, pioneers of independence movement and the framers of the constitution did not also realize that the provision of article 14 and 16 of the constitution on non-discrimination uh, and article 46 where uh, uh, there is a provision for uh, you know special attention being made to for the weaker section for equality and no discrimination. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, cannot be fulfilled uh, without uh, in the present uh, or, or the, the in inherited educational system, which was uh, inherently discriminatory. I think uh, uh, perhaps uh, there are few educational systems in the world which are as multi-layered, perplexing, and written with discrimination than the Indian school system, or I would say Indian education system as a whole. Now, uh, as I said that in some respects, the country lived up to its uh, pledge in the in Nehru's speech in the Constituent Assembly and in the constitutional provision. And as a uh, uh, you will see in many documents that uh, uh, the number of schools has increased tremendously, colleges has increased tremendously, universities have increased tremendously, number of children and students going to the institutions have increased many, many fold. Uh, but yet uh, it falls short. It falls short mainly in the sense that uh, the vast number of the children of the poor running into millions are still excluded. And, uh, uh, and I think that uh, we are not uh, on par with other countries of the world which call themselves uh, developed, or at least uh, progress on the path of development. And I will give you, even in literacy rate, I will give you uh, uh, one example of the BRICS countries. Among the BRICS countries, uh, the literacy rate uh, in 2019 was 93% uh, in Brazil, 98% in China, 100% in Russia, 88% in South Africa, and shall I say only 82% in 2019 uh, in India. Uh, and uh, I'm quoting this, this figure has been given by Professor Radhakrishnan. Now, late Professor Radhakrishna in one of his uh, essays on, 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 on edu education. Now, after independence, uh, we had uh, several uh, commissions set up. And uh, I will just uh, mention their names. I can't go into the recommendations of each of them. But just to complete the picture, uh, firstly, there was a Radhakrishnan Commission uh, report. 1949, and uh, a main feature of that report from the point of view of school education was the recommendation on 10 plus 2 system. He wanted uh, the IA and IJC to be kept left, you know, separated from university and uh, to be provided in a standalone institutions. Then, 11, 12, 9, 10, 11, 12, or combined with uh, lower secondary or maybe even middle school, uh, but not as a part of university. And I was uh, a victim of this change at that time. I had got myself enrolled in uh, Banaras University 
in the IAC course. And uh, I had studied there badly for two months. When BHU decided, first university to decide to implement Radha Krishnan Commission's report of this aspect. And the IAIC uh, education was shifted to, at that time, Central Hindu College. I don't know whether this college still exists today or not. And I had to walk additional four miles from BHU to go there. And BHU itself was two miles from where I was staying. So this six miles every day walking and coming back, I could not afford transport uh, at that time. It was impossible. And that is one of the reasons why I hastily withdrew myself from BHU and rushed to Patna to get admitted in Patna College. Uh, victim of the implementation of Radha Commission, uh, Radha Krishna Commission's report on this particular aspect. Uh, uh, then, you know, we had the National Education Policy 1968, National Education Policy 1986, as revised in 1992. Uh, now, one or two things were significant in these reports. One was that uh, uh, the 86 report permitted informal education, which became very, very controversial. And uh, there is an article by Jean Dre and uh, uh, Martha Sen in a book edited by Professor Tilak, where uh, they have said that this informal education is neither effective nor equitable not sustainable. And they devoted one full page and a half to elaborate why it is neither of these three uh, in, in practice. Uh, now, the, this was one part. Other part was that uh, the recommendation of the target of 6% of the GDP uh, by uh, the uh, 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 the uh, Kothari Commission uh, and its uh, endorsement in both the national education policies, 68 as well as 86. Uh, a little bit lukewarm in the 86, but full throated in 68 because it had come immediately after the Kothari Commission report and almost forgotten by now, if one may say it. Now we are paying only lip service to it. Uh, so this was, and the third thing that I will point out was that uh, 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 the elaboration in the Kothari Commission of the virtues of common school system as supposing to be the best uh, uh, system that one can have, uh, which ensures equity, uh, universalization, quality, everything. And uh, yet, a very trivial, trivial approach in its recommendation on how to go about establishing it. Uh, the commission says that uh, it should be experimented in a few districts. I mean, this is not how such a drastic measure is implemented in this kind of lukewarm uh, fashion. And then it was uh, more or less uh, forgotten till it was revived by some of the NGOs with which uh, I have been personally associated. And some of my colleagues here, uh, particularly Professor Batra, has also been personally associated. Uh, I think uh, I have mentioned these commission's report just to bring out their uh, key recommendation, which have significance for school education. And I would not go into the detail. Books have been written on that. Now then, in the 90s, there was a parallel development. And that was uh, the judiciary's uh, intervention in that. And uh, the most uh, uh, outstanding in this respect was the famous Unikrishnan judgment of 1991, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, the bench says that the right to education is a part of uh, a right to life under Article 21 of the fundamental rights of the Indian Constitution, and that it should be made available. 
and a few more other judgments, other cases, this was reiterated. And this led to uh, a movement gathering momentum in the country uh, that uh, uh, this should be a fundamental right, and uh, not just a, uh, you know, a directive principle to the state. And ultimately, it was adopted as a fundamental right in 2002, uh, but it was not implementable because the uh, language said uh, they, they, they made two very drastic departure from the erstwhile practice. Backward departure, I would say. One is that suddenly, for no reason or the other, they dropped it to all children up to the age of 14. They say they're from 8 to 14. Uh, and so up to 6, six to 14. Uh, and they, they just uh, left out uh, the rest of them for no reason. Or, and now they are coming back in the new education policy. But at that time, uh, they uh, took a big step backward by confining it to the age of six to uh, uh, 14. And the other thing that uh, uh, was uh, backward, that it says that uh, as the state may by law prescribe, I mean, this will be available as the state may by law prescribe. And then one waited for a good seven years for this law to come into force, not to be adopted, come into force is really eight years, April, 1st April 192010. Uh, uh, and then it came into this thing. Now, I think that uh, the uh, uh, Right to Education Act uh, was adopted in 2009, and the laws were framed. It took a little time, and it came into force from 1st April uh, 2010. Uh, it had a, most of the articles for their implementation. There was a provision of uh, uh, five years. But uh, some articles relating to teachers uh, had uh, a little longer provision. But that was also time bound. So I think uh, uh, it was a uh, landmark uh, 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 act, and uh, many people have described it in in different ways. I think uh, some have called it past breaking. Professor Krishna Kumar, who is one of the greatest experts in education that the country has produced in recent decades, uh, has called it uh, the first uh, legislation ever adopted by the Indian parliament. Uh, he has also called it uh, a culmination of an effort of 100 years uh, to, to achieve this uh, uh, goal of universalization. And uh, I think uh, 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 I have myself written quite a few long articles and essays on this subject. And uh, I will uh, uh, just sum up in two, three lines, the uh, what I call why this act was a milestone. One is that uh, for the first time in India's history, never before, the state has accepted uh, re the responsibility of providing free elementary education to all children, uh, uh, which is, uh, I mean, at that itself is historical. And then they have accepted it uh, as a right which is enforceable, which is also uh, historical, never happened before in India's history. So it has a, 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 not only the this responsibility, but all the provisions of the act, including the norms and standards prescribed in it, uh, are legally enforceable. One can go to court and say that this would have been available to me, but it's not being available. So please give the order the state to make it available. I mean, this is really what it means to be justiciable. It is a different matter how it has worked and how it is uh, working. So, uh, 
second thing is that uh, for the first time, the goal of universalization and the, its achievement within a time limit of five years was recognized. That has never been done before. It is, a, it is very, very revolutionary uh, uh, measure. Uh, the third thing is that uh, uh, there was a commitment to bring all the out of school children back to school and to organize uh, bridge courses to ensure that uh, they were put in age appropriate classes. And uh, then finally, I would say that a set of norms was being adopted. The norms were, as I pointed out, were prescribed uh, some of them, but in Tafasma Vivlar uh, committee report, uh, and then uh, they were somewhat elaborated, but not as much as I would have liked it, uh, and uh, incorporated in the uh, constitution, sorry, in the act. Now, in spite of these uh, remarkable features of the RT Act, RT Act was uh, deficient in several respects. One was that the, the original sin of excluding children below six was committed in the uh, Constitutional Amendment Act of 2002. So this sin was perpetrated in the RT Act also. The children below the age of six were left out and, and there was no provision for them uh, in this thing. And then the uh, children in the age group 15 to 18 were else also left out. It was for elementary education only and not for secondary uh, education. So these were the deficiencies, but in spite of these deficiencies, it was a, a landmark, it was path breaking and, and whatnot. Now, a few words uh, on the implementation of this act. As I pointed out that this act according to the law should have been implemented, should have been completed by 31st March 2015. That is the date. And uh, this has not happened. Uh, one, uh, uh, you know, measuring uh, criteria on which it has been, it is claimed uh, to have been implemented is access. That is today, uh, almost all children have access to uh, elementary education. And, uh, uh, and that is based on the figure for enrollment. Uh, what is called GER. And uh, that figure, as uh, Professor Tilak pointed out, uh, uh, has even reached uh, close to 100. I think some statistics I have found, it is more than 100. It is uh, the way of collecting uh, the statistics which has led to this uh, kind of thing. But you know, when I was doing the common school system uh, commission report, and when I visited uh, some eight, 10 schools in, in Bihar, uh, I found that uh, the, uh, there was a vast discrepancy between enrollment and attendance. And I remember one school I went to in a Goda subdivision uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, now Sandhal Paganas, Jharkhand, the my district. I found that uh, there were children in a government school. Uh, there were no children when I went there. And then I asked the teacher, Ki, aap log yahan par hai, aur, uh, koi hai, there are no children. He said, sir, sir, the children are reading in the other school. And that other school was uh, a private school. Oh, humare, uh, in, they were enrolled in that school, but they were reading in other school. And in general, we found the discrepancy of uh, close to 40%. I think 65, 60 to 65% of those enrolled were attending, if one, if one took an average over a period of, period of time. So this means, uh, this gives an indication of the number of children that are still out of school. And many children who can't be counted, like the children of the migrant workers, street children, children of the beggars, uh, they are not included in this statistics. And, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the uh, 
So this criteria, as I pointed out, uh, let me just quote uh, one figure in this respect. The 73rd report of the NSSO sample survey, which was the one just before the outbreak of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, it says that uh, uh, the uh, total number of children in the age group 6 to 18, which were out of school, was 4.5 crores. That is, uh, uh, no, that is, sorry, that is the census data, census data. But the 71st report says that 20% uh, uh, of the children were out of school, which is also a very big number. And the same NSSO data said that uh, 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 dropout rates, 20% drop out after class five and 40% after class 10. And uh, most of the children who drop out are from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities. And we talk about equality. And this is uh, how we treat our uh, most backward, uh, economically most backward community of our country. Now, I will quote you one more figure, which is uh, seldom quoted. And this virtually indicates that the at the time of the writing of the report, which of course is 10 years old, and things might have improved by then. And I hope that the discussions here will prove me wrong and bring me up to date. Uh, according to the socioeconomic data and caste census, which was conducted in 201213, 36% of rural India was illiterate and 14% of the children in rural areas had studied up to the primary level, only less than primary level. So this is virtually illiterate. So effective illiteracy, these two combined, adds up to 50%. And to this you add 18% of those who had completed their primary level education, but had not finished middle school. So this is 68%. So 68% were virtually illiterate. Uh, you know, in real sense of the term, were illiterate. And I'm quoting the data from the socioeconomic survey of 2012 and 13. Uh, now, if you come to age group 16 to 23, which is mostly our secondary school, higher secondary school, and a couple of years of uh, college education, uh, uh, you know that, uh, uh, as I pointed out, that uh, secondary education is outside the Right to Education Act. Uh, the government has set up uh, a Madhyamik uh, Siksha Abhyan, Abhyan uh, as it had done earlier for the uh, elementary education. Uh, and this Madhyamik Siksha Abhyan is uh, uh, something the paper to be blended about whenever it is convenient that we have taken some initiative. But if you see in the budget, the provision that has been made under this heading year after year, uh, you will be surprised. I mean, you will be appalled really. I mean, it is a, a not even 1% of what it will cost, cost if you, you know, universalize secondary education. I mean, I have not calculated the percentage, but it is some 2,000 crore rupees, 3,000 crore rupees like that. You know, so just to keep that beyond going and make some, you know, token allocation for that. So this is about secondary education. Government has a, a kind of a given up the responsibility of bringing secondary education within the ambit of universalization. It has uh, uh, wants to, uh, in many respects, hand it over to the private sector. Even the so-called model school, which a successive government have promised to set up, uh, Manmohan Singh, in his first uh, uh, 15 August speech from the ramparts of the Red Fort, has promised one model school for every district in India. And you know, in 10 years time, after Manmohan Singh, 
uh, ceased to be prime minister, not a single such school was established in 10 years time. And I am uh, privy to the negotiation that is going on between CIA and I representing the private sector because they were supposed to be done in PPE mode, public-private uh, mode. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the negotiation going on at that time. And uh, I know the conditions that the uh, private sector was trying to impose for uh, participating in this PPE mode. And these conditions uh, virtually amounted to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you, uh, instead of uh, anybody, you give us the money to do that. We would not do out of our own money. Now, in this context, uh, if I'm trying to be a little bit contemporaneous, uh, I would like to refer you to uh, Niti Ayok's uh, remark, of chair, previous chairman's remark, previous two chairman's remark. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Kumar, uh, and other is uh, Pangalia. Pangalia wrote an article three, four days ago, where he says that uh, biggest constraint to the expansion of uh, school education has been the RT Act. And their argument is that RT Act has put artificial limitations on what the private sector and the charitable institutions could have done. Now, can you really believe, can any sensible person, uh, you know, who, who has not to be taken to uh, uh, mental health institute, believe that the private sector can universalize school education in India? I mean, this reminds me of India's uh, World, uh, Cricket World Cup uh, victory. And the uh, London Times has written that it is like uh, thousands of monkeys operating on thousands of typewriters and producing a Bible. This is what India's victory was done. So if you expect private sector to universalize, it has to be like that. It is the thousands of monkeys separately working to maximize, uh, maximize their profit and producing universalization. This is what intelligent people like Pangadia are arguing uh, uh, and, and Rajiv Kumar are arguing. And, uh, uh, and you know, I mean, how unrealistic, ridiculous and false it is, is uh, plain to the common sense of an average person. And this is the argument being given but such people can being in such a responsible position. This is what, how ideology makes you mad, how ideology clouds all your uh, capacity for judgment. And that is the one kind of ideology that I'm talking about, in which I would not, the details of which I don't consider it necessary to go in this uh, presentation. Now, Going to the 16 to 23, I give you one data which uh, shows uh, how intelligent, uh, uh, how educated your country is. The, you know, percentage of uh, students going to schools of colleges in the age group 16 to 23 is 80% uh, for Scandinavian countries. 70% for most other developed countries, 30% for more developed among developing countries like Brazil, uh, say Mexico, Cuba. Uh, Cuba is very developed educationally and health wise. And uh, uh, only 10% India, only 10% of our population in the age group 16 to 23 goes to schools or college. This is, you asked me to speak on the state of school education in India, and this is the state in nutshell. Now, uh, how much more time I have? Sir, please take as per your convenience. 
there has been an attempt uh, by uh, the successive governments including the government which uh, enacted the rt act to dilute the act and i will give you just two three examples in which uh, the act has been diluted one is that uh, uh, since the present government has come to power in 2014 not a single important leader of the government education minister prime minister finance minister has reiterated that they pursue the goal of universalizing school education they have never done that uh the uh the nep does not mention universalization in that sense but i will come to that nep thing separately uh, actually what it provides and what is there in the rt act the second thing is that uh, uh, the one of the revolutionary clauses in the rt act was this time limit of 5 years within which the act was imp- implemented unless uh, that time limit is set up which which tapas uh, majumdar uh, committee did which all others who have calculated the cost of universalizing have done because you can't calculate the cost unless you have a time limit unless you have norms and you push a tight tag on the norms uh, and this is what they have done this is what my commission in in bihar had done and we have calculated the cost of establishing a common school system in bihar in terms of rupees uh, up to the figure of 10 uh the nothing of that sort has been done by this government since it has come to power and uh, uh third thing is that uh, uh, this amendment in the act that uh, you uh, the children uh, uh, will have to take exam uh, in the age group uh, uh, you know uh, 6 to 14 uh Uh, is a retrogressive act uh, by any standard of judgment because all over the world it has been found that uh, exams in this age group is a, a totally unnecessary additional burden on children which uh, has the effect of uh, dwarfing their development and growth and should not be taken in a very few countries it is done uh, in england it was done Uh, till recently but they have moved away uh, in that country also from that and now the other thing is that uh, 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 the closure of uh, schools uh, you know i mean uh, they they have invoked uh, rt act uh, to close schools and they have somewhere said that rt act is for rationalization and most effective use of resources and this can be done by closing schools which have only few children now supposing that there is a school in the place i was referring to sundar pahar of uh, godda district uh, i had uh, i was in charge of a project there for 20 villages inhabited by a tribal community called pahariya and pahariyas are the disappearing community in in india tribe their population is reducing census after census it has shown and i was in charge of the development of the area and uh, uh, i found that one school there uh, travels pahariyas from uh, say five villages would come there now if we close down that school where will they go so it's a, it's not a rationalization Uh, should, shouldn't social justice come before rationalization? 
What is the point of rationalization? It is, it is not founded on social justice. And you reduce the boys and girls coming from the Pahariya village to non-education and invoke rationalization. The RTI never talks about rationalization. It is the uh, interpretation of Rajiv Kumar and his colleagues in the Niti Ayo, which has brought in this co concept. And it's created havoc under that name in, in school after school uh, in many states of, of, of India. Uh, so this is another way in which, uh, and I would say that uh, the introduction of this institution called Samagra Siksha Abhiyan is another form of diluting the RT Act. Because Samagra Siksha Abhiyan contains the budget for both uh, um, you know, secondary education and elementary education. We know that elementary education budget is very high. It has to be because there is a time limit, there is a priority, global priority on primary education, and that secondary education is neglected. So the consequence of bringing the budgets of these two countries and keeping it intransparent to the merging of the civil servant as to what fund will be drawn for what purpose means that even the limited resources for primary education, you can, the magistrate can divert it for secondary education, which is a gone case in any case in the present situation in the, in the country. And so I think that this is another form of uh, dilution. Uh, now I will go to uh, uh, resources as you uh, very rightly pointed out. Uh, let me just quote uh, a few figures. Uh, I am very different uh, about using the correct language because Professor Tilak is here. Uh, he is the absolute master in this area. Uh, I had referred to uh, uh, the Tapas Mojizdar thing. I think I had correct figure. It was 1,37,000 crore for 10 years to universalize elementary education. And it was not, uh, you know, it was according to the provision of the constitution, up to 14, not, not 6 to 14. And it was uh, 13,700 crores per annum. Okay. Then uh, we adopted the RT Act. Now I was uh, in the kind of a, in the back, behind the scene lobby when the RT Act was being, in the, was being enacted and drafted. And I was privy to all the documents that were being circulated, some of them internally, very significant document. And perhaps uh, some of you would know, who might have been in the same position as me, that uh, a memorandum on financial implication was an integral part of the act till the last moment when it was detached from the act. And that memorandum uh, was based on uh, uh, resources uh, calculation. Uh, uh, the, I have a copy of that uh, memorandum with me in, in my files. And uh, uh, it has a, a Cape Committee recommendation, 72,000 crores in the best scenario, additional resources per annum, and 53,000 crores per annum in the worst scenario. Worst means rate of growth that you assume. Uh, uh, now, when the RT Act was launched in 2010, uh, the uh, overall you know, decision makers, but at the planning commission were all come, sanctioned 36,000 crores. But the finance ministry, it went back to, and they brought it down to uh, a little about 20,000 20, crores. Because the previous year's figures was 10,000, 11,000 crores. And they gave the argument that, you know, we had nearly, nearly doubled from 11, I remember it was 11,000 crores. So 11,000 crores, we are making it to 20,000 crores. What more do you want? So if you go by requirement, then the, even the planning commission 
had approved 36,000 crores. So 20,000 was provided and has hovered around 20,000. And then in that, two drastic cuts were made. One was to the 014 and other was uh, just last budget. And 2014, uh, you know, I mean, the expenditure on uh, Sarv Shiksabhyan was cut by almost 30%. Uh, expenditure on midday meals was cut by 40% or so. And expenditure on ICDS, which is not a part of the act, but now integrated, I mean, integral was, was reduced by 50%. 49% if my calculation is correct. Now, in the most recent thing, uh, this uh, reduction has been by 5,000 crores, sub 7,000 crores, and uh, midday meals, once, once again, uh, about 32% cut. My, I mean, ICDS, 32% cut. So, you know, if you have to balance your budget, if you have to adhere to a fiscal deficit ratio as prescribed from some higher quality. If you have to fight, reduce expenditure to fight inflation, it is the education which is first cut. Or it is the education where the most drastic cut is made. You study the figure and you tell me if my conclusion is incorrect. Uh, I'm generalizing it perhaps a bit too drastically, but this is what appeals to my my common sense. So this is about the finances. I would not go into it anymore. Now, uh, uh, I would now uh, very briefly uh, go to the uh, new economic uh, education policy. Uh, we have myself and the late, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ambarish Rai have written a 42 page commentary on uh, our views on the recommendations of the NEP. And the copies are available here. So, any of you who would like to have a copy, you can take it. Now, it's not my intention to summarize this thing to, to you in this uh, brief speech. But I think one or two factors that you should know, uh, I'm trying to uh, bring that uh, out. And uh, it is that uh, the uh, uh, firstly, the title suggests uh, fundamental right should prevail upon policy. So the RT Act uh, must be placed at a higher pedestal than the NEP, which is after all a statement of the intention of the government to do certain things. Whereas the RT Act uh, is a legally enforceable commitment of the government. So it must prevail upon the NEP. Uh, second thing is that uh, 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 there is no calculation of resources for the implementation of the any of the important measures recommended in the uh, NEP. No, no calculation at all. So it is all, all left to the mercy of the government, which they will implement, which they will not implement, for which they will make resources available, which will lie stagnant in the, in the, you know, in the report, and uh, how much of resources they will make available. It is all to the discretion of the government. Thirdly, there is that uh, uh, it, uh, uh, there is no budgeting of resources. I mean, if there is no calculation, then there cannot be budgeting. So there is no budgeting of these resources. Then it uh, uh, reintroduces some of the, uh, you know, kind of uh, backward uh, retrogressive measures that is to prevail earlier. And I will mention two of them. One of them I have told you that uh, uh, reintroduction of the examination system. In the NEP, there are three examinations to be held uh, from, you know, zero class to class eight. Three exams to be held in that. But there were none in this thing. 
And as I pointed out that uh, experience all over the world has indicated that the children in this age group should not be subjected to attacks. Uh, second thing is that uh, uh, it, it reintroduces uh, non-formality, formalization and voluntarism in education. That education will be provided uh, by volunteers, by uh, peer uh, children, same peer group, or by somebody in the community who uh, moves forward. And such so touching is the faith of Mr. Rajiv Kumar and Pangadia in the efficacy of these measures that they have said that the RT was a retrospective measure. Otherwise, there would have been a flooding of resources by the private sources and the charitable institutions. Does it make you feel uh, laugh or uh, just uh, uh, keep quiet? Uh, I think uh, uh, the proposals, it proposes the establishment of structures and institutions which will take years to materialize and may never materialize. And each institution and, and uh, structure uh, would be heralded with a great fanfare, as it already has been done, but no guarantee that it will be on a sustainable basis, because that requires resources. And you refuse to commit resources. So, I mean, there cannot be anything better than empty, empty promises. And uh, uh, in the mean, you know, it, it suggests structural changes which will take years to implement, but in the process, it will disturb the existing structures and throw the education system uh, in disarray. Uh, I mean, like a 10 plus two system. 10 plus two system is supposed to be replaced by what is called five plus three plus three plus four. I mean, I can explain to you what is five plus three plus three plus four, but let's not go into that. Now, you know that 10 plus two was recommended by the Allocation Commission in 1949. And I had the experience of looking at schools in Bihar. In Bihar, there are 13 kinds of schools. And uh, in many schools, uh, this uh, 11, 12 is a part of, uh, in a Christian missionary school, 11, 12 is a part from, you know, uh, preschool to 11, 12. And they don't want to open school unless it is all of them, because they have only then it is the financially viable. Uh, if the preschool education is not included in the school education, it cannot be financially viable. Uh, and many private, uh, uh, you know, institutions, other institutions have also given this proof. Uh, so this is a, uh, so I would say, Sometimes the plus two is a part of high school. Sometimes plus two is standalone. And sometimes it is from seven to 12. Sometimes it is a 10 to 12. This is what we object. And in my report, there is a, a number of schools of that kind that are there. And we really recommended the reduction of the 13 types of school into three types. And these three, without that common school system, cannot be established. And these three, uh, I would not go into the detail of it again. Uh, so this is a, another problem that when 10 plus two recommended in 1949, is still in the process of implementation, is still a work in progress. Then, then you make this drastic change and you say that uh, uh, it, is a, it is a progress. And so, this is another problem that I find with the NEP. And uh, then uh, 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 I will not uh, go further into that. I now come to the concluding uh, part as to what I would like to have. I tell you, to be honest, if any uh, in, uh, Indian citizen at a responsible position wants to be honest with his countrymen, or wants to be honest to himself, then 
he cannot but implement a common school system in India. Without implementing a common school system in India, you cannot be honest about the promises that you made. You cannot be honest about introducing equality. You cannot be honest about removing discrimination. You cannot be honest about doing something for the backward people, the scheduled caste, scheduled type, the Muslims, the uh, you know the, the 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 women. You cannot be honest. It is just a lift of If you really want to have to be honest, you have to have common school system. You know, a, a point that I want to pose to you, uh, to the researchers, is that how is that uh, all developed countries, almost all of them, some of them earlier, other later, have adopted the common school system and have progressed on that basis. But uh, they themselves in their aid program and the World Bank in its aid, aid program never recommended that India should have a common school system. And they bought the argument that it cannot be done because of paucity of resources. Or they provided the rationale to the argument given by politicians. The World Bank strengthened the rationale of the argument of the politician that it cannot be done because we don't have resources. But how is that none of the developed countries, America, U US, who have a dominant role in the World Bank, in the UN system, none of them recommended that India should have a common school system, that all the developing countries should convert themselves into a common school system. Why did it not recommend? Why did they not recommend? So you go into the history of aid to developing countries and you arrive at your own conclusion that I want to pose this question to you. I have my answer, which I can give when I have an, an appropriate opportunity. Uh, so I think uh, common school system is my final recommendation. If you uh, do not have, uh, do not recommend common school system and you want to uh, go by other recommendations, then at least the, the NEP should have recommended universalization, which is already done in the RT Act for elementary education. But nowhere the term universalization has been used. And here I will uh, read out to you the differences uh, in the RT Act and this thing. Uh, uh, the NEP does not have the goal of uh, universalization explicitly mentioned, which is in a situation preparing India uh, can be the uh, only long term goal, uh, not really long term. With the side tacking of the RT Act, the NEP virtually jettisons the goal of universalizing elementary education. In its place, it juxtaposes the vague objective, which reads as follows. A concerted national effort will be made to ensure universal access and afford opportunity to all children of the country to quality holistic education. It is a best in our basis. It's not a legal commitment. A concerted effort will be made. On the, whether it will succeed, not succeed, what kind of effort it is, is uh, uh, not spelled out. There is no legally enforcement. There is no calculation of resources. There is no provision of budget for these resources. As it was at least done in the partial movement towards universalization as contained in the RT Act. Uh, there is no, uh, so this is, uh, uh, the goal that uh, I would say long-term goal. The one, another thing that I find missing and which we had done uh, in Bihar report, and uh, I would like this audience to know about it. Gandhi's is a recommendation of work-related education. If you read uh, how Gandhiji explains that uh, from the example of uh, spinning, that is from the 
time of the growing of cotton to the spinning, to the measurement of the cloths to be made out of that, to the things involved in going to the market. All this becomes the subject of education. And it is a complete education virtually at a stage where conceptualization is not involved. And uh, uh, Gandhiji's Bunyadi uh, Siksha uh, in a, as a whole was rejected during his lifetime in the recommendation of the Zakir Hussain uh, Committee, which uh, was set up during his lifetime. But I think that uh, after his lifetime, uh, time has come to see the far fetched or far reaching, sorry, far reaching character of this measure. Uh, and I think that uh, in our, there were 1,300 Bunyadi Vidyalaya in Bihar when we undertook our uh, exercise. And Prime Minister, Chief Minister, same Chief Minister, he has been Chief Minister since then, Nitish Kumar. He gave us the separate mandate to recommend on what to do with this Bunyadi Vidyalaya. And we went there, there was tremendous amount of land attached to each Bulgari Vidyalaya. There was, there were cow sheds, earlier there used to be cows and uh, bullocks to cultivate and uh, education was provided at the same time. Now, what we have suggested is that uh, there could be a cumulative experience in the people who have been associated with this institution. So you convert hundreds of this institution into places of experiment to evolve a course on work-related education and introduce this thing to the lower primary, up to the lower primary, where conceptualization is not, is very remotely required. Uh, when nobody will say that, uh, you know, you have work-related education to evolve a complicated formula of algebra or geometry, which comes much later in life. But at least till the primary level, this can be introduced and we recommended it seriously. Of course, our whole report was rejected by Nitish Kumar. But I wish that when the NAP talked about skill formation, uh, they should have brought in this Gramsian concept. That would have been a real innovation. And we could have shown to the world that something which has never happened can be done. Now, nobody can say that this experiment would succeed. But uh, after all, what is innovation if there is not an element of adventure, risk involved in that? Gandhiji took that risk the whole life long. Can't we take a risk in relation to one of the suggestions that he made in his life, lifetime and could never be implemented? So this is another thing that we would like the report should have continued. And finally, I would uh, end up uh, by a few concrete measures. I think uh, what we expect is that this government should uh, reiterate the nation's commitment to the goal of universalization of uh, school education, including pre-primary and uh, secondary. Secondly, that uh, it should set up a new time frame for that. And uh, uh, we think that uh, if in 2001, the time frame was five years, why should it be more than that today? It should be five years, not more than five years. We have already defaulted on our promise in a legal document. And if we are going to amend our default, then you can, we can be given at most five years more. And I think it is feasible, workable to implement it in five years. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, now the government has given vague way without committing resources. They have announced that some of the things that they will do in 2030. Now why 10 years? God knows what will happen. Uh, which new government will come to power, they will take their own view. So it should be five years. And uh, I believe that uh, two years of uh, 
free primary education should be included in the RT Act and the whole of secondary education. Fourthly, the norms should be expanded. The norms are uh, very, very few. And uh, uh, if you see the American system, the Scandinavian system, uh, norms are so elaborately laid down as to really make for quality of, uh, of education. Thirdly, that uh, resources should be provided. Price tag should be put on the norms and resources will be provided. I think that there's a talk about, this is my fifth point, of uh, a, a independent commission for higher education in place of uh, the University Grants Commission and the, uh, you know, the, the Committee for uh, Professional Education. Uh, teachers, uh, even, you, what is that committee? I forget. Uh, I think if something, an independent commission is required, it is first and foremost required for school education. Because that is a, such a sensitive part, such an important part, that it should be monitored by a highest level group, changes suggested, norms revised, and uh, it should be a last court of arbitration as to whether the government is fulfilling its constitutional obligation or not. If that arbitration uh, can be challenged only in the Supreme Court and the High Court. This is uh, another suggestion that I would like to make, make. If the commission, separate commissioner, and this commission should not be filled with all the chief ministers and all the education ministers and all the prime ministers. It should be purely, you know, uh, educationists and, and experts uh, in this field. And I think that uh, 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 this is uh, uh, my other suggestion. And uh, uh, so with this, uh, uh, I, will, I will now conclude with these remarks. I'm sorry I have taken such a long time. I'm subjected to to such a long uh, factual and, and data filled, uh, you know, kind of rigor. Uh, but uh, uh, I hope that you would have benefited to some extent uh, by this uh, presentation of mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a very elaborate, long presentation, an exhaustive presentation on several issues relating to school education. Uh, it was brilliant one and covered many critical issues and you have, uh, as usual you have been uh, very very passionate at the same time critical to many many aspects that the government is doing and government is not doing in fact you have taken us through the history of education in india um, which is of course not a very pleasant story to listen uh, rather you have highlighted how we have missed the several important opportunities both before independence and also after independence and how we were not serious to the goals that we set for ourselves, how we diluted our goals, whether it is uh, given by the commissions or whether they are part of the policies or the earlier or the present one or uh, other cases, how time plans were differed in several cases from 6% GDP uh, to several norms in RTE and several other things, and uh, how many distortions are taking place and the gap between intentions and the policy actions are uh, is widening. I think uh, it's extremely difficult for me to sum up, but I don't want to say that at all. But I agree with your complete point that yes, mm, we wonder if we look at the history that was presented now, we really wonder how serious we have been with the uh, goal of universalization of school education or universalization of elementary education in the country during the last 70 years. That uh, we really have big questions. Uh, we have really missed an important opportunity or several opportunities to introduce a good, strong, current common school system, which I personally feel is the most important instrument of ensuring equality in the society, apart from other aspects. And uh, it will reduce inequalities of various nature in education. And build and help in building a very strong, equitable society. But um, unfortunately, 
the Qatari Commission, which has described it elaborately, but did not strongly recommend it, as, is, as you have rightly stated, and we have never taken it up seriously. Perhaps we could have been very good if the RTE has included it, but that has also not included. And what was also included, but also not taken up very seriously at later point of time. You showed us how they, we have made few turns uh, with respect to quite a few policy provisions that were made. And we should understand how damaging it is in the long term for the development of education. And as the goals for education still remain unaccomplished over a very long time to come. I think uh, an important point that you have made and which is important, which is uh, crucial is the social commitment, a strong social long-term commitment to education is absolutely essential. And that's how countries have progressed uh, with respect to education, the countries which have progressed. And with the absence of a social strong commitment from the government and a strong social pressure on the government to do it, I think it becomes very, very difficult. <laughs> There are already several appreciative comments and also questions on uh, Professor Dubey's lecture. Uh, but I think uh, we, I, I will raise, I'll refer to some of those questions so that the panelists will take up perhaps in their presentation. But before that, I would like to also, also like to say that the countries which have successfully universalized the education uh, have not depended upon private sector at all, historically. Even in those countries where private sector is strong, otherwise, and even those countries where private sector, say in higher education is strong, but still the school education is completely or mostly public, and they are still public, uh, even in this neoliberal era. So that's an important point that we should recognize that private sector can't be depended upon for a goal, a lofty goal like universalization of education. Um, not only in the near future, but even, uh, even at a long time to do that. <laughs> well, uh, we have eminent uh, panelists. Uh, we start with Professor Poonam Batra. You see, I, there are more than a dozen questions already. And some of the questions if, uh, are slightly repetitive, but very, very important questions were made, apart from several appreciative comments on Professor Dubey's lecture. Um, what will happen? We have stalled our uh, education sector from public, solved our public resources. And we are encouraging private sector deliberately. And that's also a point Professor Dubey made. And he's, uh, I think Professor Goman or so wanted slightly more reaction from the panelists. And uh, Professor Dubey at the end, of course. Uh, there are also comments about the, what do we say about the Delhi model schools, uh, which are which are also using the same, same term, same nomenclature of model schools, but how are they different and whether we can adopt uh, those, those models in other, other, other states in the country. Uh, what, what is, uh, how far we can use the online education, how far we can use digital tools for providing good quality school education, equitably and accessible to all. Uh, these are the questions that were raised by the participants. Uh, some of the participants, and I'm not referring to all the questions, there are several other questions. And at this particular stage, it also becomes very important to see that we know that COVID has really distorted every sector, including causing a huge damage to the school education sector. Uh, and uh, how to deal with this situation in the post-COVID situation, how to deal with the additional educational, additional problems that we are confronting today. I think some reflections on some of these questions will be very, very valuable. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not listing all the questions, but perhaps we'll get some more time at the end. And I'll request now the panelists, Professor Poonam Batra, to take uh, time and uh, give a brief reaction to some of these issues. Professor Poonam Batra. Uh, thank you, Professor Luck. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dubey, for giving us uh, uh, a very sort of brief and yet uh, specific in many ways overview. Uh, of the state of school education in India. Uh, and I think that uh, your story that you have told us uh, appears to, um, as Professor Tilak said, remind us that we have not only missed several opportunities on the way when the 1968 policy did not take the common school system seriously, but that this story also tells us that educational inequalities have sustained over a long period of time. And I think that is what is a kind of lens that I will take in these 10 minutes to express 
and perhaps add to the um, scholarly presentation made by Professor Dube. So we're not surprised that the gender gap continues to hover around 17% even now. We're not surprised that uh, the SCST levels of education are anywhere between 7 to 14% below that of the upper class. But what surprises me is the analysis done by Phil Kumble about five years ago when he presented in a conference, which is now part of a book that has been uh, published by Orient Longman on inequality in education. And he says that Dalits are likely to take more than seven decades to come anywhere near the levels of higher education of the general population. Now, this tells us where we are. This tells us how much we've been able to really move from our promises in terms of education universalization in a free India. It's quite clear that you know, educational inequality has manifested in many different ways in the country. I mean, one of course clearly is a complete, more recently is the complete non-compliance of the RTE. And we've seen that happening over the years. We've seen how RTE in the National Education Policy 2020 presented as a historic artifact, something that happened in the past, but is not something that the policy engages with. There are only two references to the RTE in this document. And what surprises me is that the policy confounds us into believing that it is talking about extending the RTE to the lower levels, like Professor Dube mentioned, the pre-primary levels and the upper secondary, post-secondary levels of school education, because it stresses on foundational literacy and it stresses on you know, uh, higher ed uh, education at the plus two level as well. But the point is, there are no mechanisms made clear in the policy that talk of how do we do that? So by not extending the RTE, but by stressing on the pre-primary and the post-elementary levels, it is confounding us into believing that RTE is being extended. The other thing I would say in which the educational inequalities manifest, of course, are in the rapid unregulated private school expansion, which we've seen over the years. Not only that, we've actually not only seen clear sort of hierarchy within the government school system, that is from a corporation school to a model school, to a Kendra Vidyale, to a Novodya Vidyale, the resources are so varied and the whole inputs are so varied. Not only are there shades and shades of unequal learning environments, but what we find is that this unequal kind of structural provisioning and the learning environment has actually only compounded over the years. So for example, the private sector is even more shaded with different hues uh, compared to the government school sector. And yet the NEP is trying to thrust, uh, you know, uh, lay, lay a thrust on privatization. So we find, let's say, the Delhi government schools, a question that has been asked in the, in the, in the chat box, I think the so-called revolutionary model uh, is very wanting within the field of curriculum and pedagogy. It is doing very well in terms of adding classrooms, making schools much better in terms of infrastructure, enabling laboratories to be in place and perhaps support staff to some extent. And I would say kudos to the Delhi government for that. But as far as the pedagogic vision goes, I think it emanates from a group of technocrats who are advising them, who believe that you should be main, you should be uh, sort of streamlining children into what are what is called uh, nishta groups, and you know uh, what are they called? I mean, there are different names to them, <laughs> and I keep forgetting because you know Indians are very good at coining. Who said Americans are good at coining terms? I think we are far better than them. But the question is that the children in the Nishta group, which is supposed to be the lowest in the hierarchy, are actually crying and pleading to take them out of Nishta and put them in Pratibha or some other uh, Pratibha, right? That's the name. So I, I think this is 
the way in which educational inequality is even entering into processes of learning, into environments of learning. And I think, of course, it is coming out of the structural provisioning, which itself is unequal, but we need to understand what it's doing in terms of learning environments as well. And it's clear a lot of scholars have been arguing that educational inequality does not stem directly from economic inequality, that there is lack of cultural capital, that there is lack of supportive and mediating facilities. So if we create learning environments in which capability deprivation is generated as a result of inequality within the learning environment, then how do we say that you know, educational inequality can be taken care of. To my mind, if we look at even very sort of figures, and I think Professor Dubey has given us a lot of data to think about, but if I may also mention the 2019 draft policy that is before the 66 page document came up, it talked of uh, the need for 1 million teachers because there were that many vacancies and a PTR as high as one is to 60. Now as per RTE norms, India requires 8.3 million teachers to cater to 25 million elementary and secondary school children in 1.5 million schools. And if you look at these figures, it's daunting because not only is there shortage of teachers, but where there are teachers, they are contractual in nature. There are 1.13 million contractual teachers in Indian schools. And largely these are women. That also shows not only a trend of feminization, which is largely still an urban phenomena, but it shows how more and more women are being drawn into a lesser paid teaching jobs, which means the provision of cheap labor, labor that sort of you know, is, is filled by women. And I think these are questions of educational inequality and of course the larger system, how it impacts our society. So if you look at 1950 figures, there were 18 women to every 100 teachers, men, men teachers. And now 2009 figures show us that there are 75 women to 100 men teachers. Now schools are sites of discrimination is nothing to hide. There's enough research that tells us that <clears throat> this kind of an unequal landscape has been now mediated more and more through global trends of commercialization, privatization, I would even say internationalization perhaps, and a lot of questions of accountability and surveillance of teachers have actually become part of what, are, what I would call technocratic regimes. These are the regimes that, are, that have become the center of education, literally. And we saw this happening specifically during the pandemic when teachers, when they had a little bit of elbow space in the classroom, to exercise that little agency they had, even that got lost because teachers in the Delhi government schools were instructed not to talk to their students <clears throat> unless through the methods, the video links, the worksheets that, that were provided to teachers and teachers were just conduits to pass that on through WhatsApp groups to children which means that that little agency that they had, even that got lost during the pandemic. We have done a study on looking at the impact of the pandemic on school education. And we find that teachers were surveilled to such an extent that private schools had different kinds of problems, government schools had different kinds of problems, but not here to discuss in detail. Clearly then, as indicated by Professor Dubey and iterated by Professor Tilak, the question remains that critical issues of equity, of social justice have been completely severed from the very educational provisioning and arrangements that we are making. And we find a reflection of this in the NEP 2020. 
So if we look at the position of even teacher education, which is preparing teachers, we found in 2012 through the Justice Verma Commission report that there were 80% school children in government schools, <clears throat> while 95% of the teachers were prepared through private teacher training institutes. Today, that figure is probably 65% school children, but the te <coughs> teacher education institute continue to rise within the private sector. Now, it also means that out of the 20,000, 21,000 plus teacher education institutes mentioned on the uh, NCT website, we find about half of them are in the elementary education sector, which is offering the ed and very, very few of them offering a university-based four-year program. But this also means that this bulk of the teacher education sector is completely outside the university higher education system, which means our teachers are not even being prepared to engage with frontiers of knowledge, to update themselves, and to be able to engage with quality education. And therefore, the question of quality education, one of the chat box questions was, that is quality equitable education a freebie or a ravery? And I think not at all. It is a fundamental right. And we better understand that it is fundamental at least at the elementary level because we have a central legislation. But what the RTE has been uh, subject to is very serious amendments. Three amendments already done. It has diluted the act, whether it's the no detention policy, whether it's extension of teacher qualifications and whether it is the most I would say scathing attack on the RTE is the inclusion of learning outcomes and converting the right to education into right to learning, which means you've reduced education to just learning, which is not what education is. We all understand that the state of education system in the country is about developing citizens who are active and who can question not only government policy, but even question and assert their and others' rights. But our education is reduced to mere skills and learning of those skills. I would just like to qu uh, quickly wind up by saying that not only did Niti Aayog uh, move on with its policy of school mergers, but the NEP justifies it. And as Professor Dube put it eloquently, it is about rationalization which actually is called rationalization because you, un you need to understand that by school mergers, we are actually taking away the rights that we have given to our children through RTE and even through 1986 policy where we said that there will be schools within one kilometer of the habitation. We have actually now taken away their right and left those children especially in remote habitations, completely without any space for learning. And I think what the NEP is further trying to do is saying it in black and white, that the restrictions of RTE norms will be further taken away. And they're calling it restrictions. What are those restrictions? Norms. Now here we are talking about expanding those norms and making them far more enforceable and far more uh, sort of uh, wider and deeper. And here the NEP is talking about let, making them less restrictive, which actually means that we are opening the floodgates for not only one teacher schools like the Ekal Vidyalaya to come back, where states have spent a lot of time like Himachal Pradesh trying to get rid of one teacher schools and give more teachers where they are required, but now we are opening the floodgates for going back actually. So in a sense, NEP is regressive. The second most important thing that the NEP has done, which I think is very, very dangerous, is to open the spaces for ideological capture of the school space. Very clearly the NEP is going to give the, the space for all kinds of schools to come into which are obviously not compliant with the RTE, but by already dismissing RTE, the NEP is not quite bothered. The question therefore is, 
that even if we look at the policies before NEP came in, so there were a series of measures that were taken that culminated in the NEP 2020. One of them is Samagra Shiksha. And Samagra Shiksha means the merger of three major uh, schemes of the government of India, including teacher education, uh, Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, and uh, uh, the middle uh, school, right? The Madhyamik Shiksha. Now, when you merge the three, your allocations, which were already down in terms of finances, have become even worse. And the Samagra Shiksha has a much smaller kitty from which you will be able to do or not be able to do very much of justice to school education. The post-pandemic scenario is, the, is really very, very grim, which means that Central Square Foundation kind of organizations have been writing and advocating that low fee paying private schools have been closing down and advocating to the government of India to please allot public funds to these schools, treat them as SMA, MSMEs so that they can be sustained. Now we are at a stage where not only are we merging schools, not only are we withdrawing, but we are now going to use public funds to actually give it to the private players to for school education. And that I think is a dangerous space. Within the pandemic era, teachers have been completely disempowered and the teaching learning process, like the worksheets which were made in bulk by all kinds of te technocratic organizations, in fact has gone and the child is the new consumer of education. This is what digitalization has done. So while at one level, India does boast of the fact that we have been able to give access to education, I think digital education during and after the pandemic and in the policy thrust is reopening questions of access because there are no more than 23% households that have internet connection and some areas much worse than that. The last point I'd like to make here is that the NEP does not show any respect for the constitutionally mandated categories of SC, ST, OBC. It has put in one basket of SEDGs everybody who is marginalized. Women, linguistic minorities, disabilities, migrant labor, apart from SC, ST, Muslim uh, girls. If you put all that together, it probably goes beyond 85% of India's population. What I read of NEP 2020 is a, sis, a foundation being laid for a segregated school system. One for the privileged 20% or even less, another for the underprivileged 80% and more. And I think this is the most dangerous part that we are treading on because it is in policy today and there's very little resistance. And I must make <clears throat> this statement here that I have been very shocked and surprised that some of the most progressive minds in this country have fallen into the trap of looking at NEP 2020 as a progressive document. I think it is deeply sugar-coated and I think it is deeply inequitous. It has completely severed questions of social justice and equity, which our constitution committed to and which we have brought into policy right up to 1986, even though 86 was like a precursor to neoliberal reforms. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hope that we can have deeper discussions and perhaps some action around the questions of uh, status of school education in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Batra. Uh, Professor Tilak, I would like to just take your permission to introduce Dr. Haim Borker before you invite her uh, to make her presentation. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Haim Borkar. She's the assistant professor at the Department of Social Work, Jamia Millia Islamia. She has authored the book, Madarsas and the Making of Islamic Womanhood. We welcome you, ma'am. And without any further ado, over to you. Dr. Haim Borkar. Yeah. Thank you so much. I thought uh, of highlighting, Haim Borkar, just one second. I thought of highlighting the point uh, Poonam sure. made. Sure. Uh, Poonam has uh, brought our attention to how the principles of social justice and inequalities are being forgotten in, in our pursuit for 
modern kind of growth, and particularly how education inequalities are getting widened. I think it's quite uh, important, of course, economic inequalities cause education inequalities when you have a lot of literature, but the converse is also true and it's perhaps more true. The educational inequalities cause a very high degree of socioeconomic inequality. And education can be a more powerful instrument than economic and other strategies to reduce inequalities in the country. So I, I thought of making that point. In fact, somebody says it's the education inequalities are the mother of all inequalities uh, in, in the society. I think that's very important to note that. Uh, well, mm, let me let's take off, uh, let's listen to Professor Hema. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm extremely humbled to be called on this platform and to be speaking amongst um, uh, all stalwarts. Um, uh, I will be taking off from where Professor Dube and Professor Batra both um, sort of spoke. Um, I also feel a little um, sort of, uh, you know, what, what do I say after everything has been said? But I will uh, try to add my two pennies of wisdom uh, to the discussion. Um, I think we've all sort of heard the news uh, with a lot of uh, sadness, uh, about uh, on 20th July about the nine-year-old Dalit child who was beaten by his teacher in Rajasthan and eventually succumbed to his injuries uh, for allegedly touching a drinking water pot that he was not supposed to touch. Uh, when this news came to light and in Jamia I teach a paper called Education and Social Exclusion, uh, some of my students asked me that, you know, ma'am, how is this different from what we read about uh, Ambedkar's biography, you know, where he wrote about his own schooling days in 1904, saying that um, he had to take permission from a touchable person uh, to drink water. And that touchable person was often the peon. And so he says that if there was no peon, there was no water for me. And um, I think Ma'am rightly pointed out in her sort of discussion before mine that there are countless such incidents from schooling sites across India that highlight that how the everyday experience of schooling in India, be it for any section of marginalized groups, the Dalits, uh, tribals, girls, children belonging to minorities, the differently abled, it greatly differs from the sort of constitutional values that we proclaim of social justice and equality. Schooling and education does actively reproduce disadvantage. Yet at the other end, like Professor Tilak just highlighted, that we have equally inspiring stories of emancipation and empowerment. And I think therein lies the power and paradox of education, which possibly gives us, uh, even in dark times, a reason to hope and have the sort of discussion that we're happening today, that while it can reproduce disadvantage, it can also be a great equalizer. Uh, in India, education lies at the heart of realizing our democratic ideals. It's an intrinsic human right. It's enshrined as a fundamental right under Article 21. And I remember Professor Dube, even in our personal discussions, often saying that what he cited in today's lecture also, that we cannot divorce the right to education from the right to life and dignity. And I would like to, in my discussion, reflect on the state of school education in India from this sort of lens and uh, build on some of the points that were raised by the keynote speaker and uh, uh, you know the chair and Professor Batra. Uh, India stands at a point where we, in fact, even at the beginning of the NEP, where we are often talking about the demographic dividend, a young productive population that can drive economic growth. Uh, but for this dividend to materialize, education is the key enabler and the driver. We are often told that this would need quality education. Now, how do we define quality, I think, is what we are all sort of grappling with. For me, uh, and the lens that I would take, there is no quality education without inclusive education. In a country with over 100 languages, nine major religions, 3,000 castes, and a range of ethnic groups, quality education means harnessing and reaping this diversity by integrating it in our schools and curriculum, pedagogy, knowledge construction. And that is only when a sort of, you know, like what ma'am said, that we are not in the business of producing something. We are in the business of creating active citizens. Active citizens require transformative agency. 
And where does that transformative agency come from? It comes from the sort of school system of education that we are instilling. And I would like to highlight two important lampposts in this, which have both taken place uh, in 2020 in many ways. And I think that's what the speakers and all of us have sort of also focused on. And uh, one obviously that stands out is the new education policy 2020. Uh, I think there are some things that do stand out in the policy. Uh, uh, I think uh, teaching makes you see the pros and the cons. Uh, so in terms of the pros and in terms of what stands out, definitely the inclusion of early childhood care and education, the sort of excluded group, which, you know, I think there was a lot of championing around it, even when the RD was passed that, you know, there should be inclusion of this group within the ambit of RD. So the very focus, I think the visibilizing of this group in the NEP is something that that's important. Uh, I would also, um, I heard what ma'am said very, very carefully about the fact that uh, about the 20 versus the 80% in India. And I think she absolutely says the right point. Uh, but surprisingly, I see that as a bit of a strength in uh, the NEP where it talks about um, uh, in addition to the constitutional mandated categories of SCST, OBC, women in PWD, it talks about multiple axes of exclusion that operate in India. So it talks about geographical identities, the rural versus urban divide. Uh, it talks about socioeconomic conditions. That obviously has its own shortfalls in the way NEP addresses this, which I am going to come to. But I think the fact that an acknowledgement of the fact that there are multiple axes of exclusion. So there is a disabled child living in a rural area. I think uh, which has not adequately be dealt, has not been adequately been dealt with in policy in terms of how this exclusion will be addressed. But the very fact that this exclusion is acknowledged, I think is something that uh, I would like to flag here. It also talks about, you know, sort of the linguistic divide and, you know, it promotes multiple languages. Another point of the NEP that does deserve some degree of credit is, you know, the talk about technology because, even with all its dividing factors, we are living in a technological age. Uh, infusion of technology is a reality. Um, the biggest drawback is that each of even these glimmers of hope that the NEP does offer, you know, when we look for the silver lining in the dark cloud, is that even these are not within, they're like these tall declaratory statements. But how do we achieve that? What is the roadmap? How will we concretize, for example, addressing exclusion? How will we concretize addressing marginalization? How will we concretize the inclusion of ECCE? And what will be the frame? What all the points that Professor Dubey has already raised, the framework, the resources, um, the, the steps towards achieving this are something that the policy is extremely, uh, which ma'am said, confounds us by saying that, you know, into making us believe that this is what I, I mean, or this is what the NEP2 aspires to achieve. But when we search and scan for it, scan for how and the what and the where and the when, it, it sort of leaves us wanting. Um, learning for all in the NEP 2020 risks remaining an empty phrase. And this is betrayed by the dismantling of the old system of 10 plus two, instituting a new system, the five plus three plus three plus four, without telling us what, when, how. Uh, the attempt to address the issue of out of school children, again, extremely declaratory. Who, declaratory. Who are the out of school children? Why? What is the composition of the marginalized groups in this out of school children? What about the, nev the people who have never been enrolled in school? What are the structural constraints? How does the NEP choose to address this? We get nothing out of reading the 66 page document. In terms of curriculum and pedagogy, it creates some very 
uh, it highlights some words which i mean i would like to problematize here multidisciplinary training experiential learning multilingualism multilingualism flexibility especially in terms of reduction of curriculum what would these entail we had our ncf 2005 framework which was radical in terms of integrating experiences which did away with rote learning and talked about how it in fact executed it in the textbooks uh, what does an inclusion of different perspectives look like i often cite this example in my classroom which i would like to cite here about you know in a history classroom lesson integrating the story of eklavya right as a child in a text box not saying that who is right whether the mainstream version of the mahabharat with the pandavas versus the kauravas and the good versus the bad or and that text box which stands out which makes a child think where does this fit it doesn't offer answers but it makes you think where is how is this going to be achieved in the new curriculum what is the pedagogy that we are going to follow what is the new curricular framework going to look like we are again left with a lot of questions but very few answers similarly with the three language formula uh the introduction of you know sort of imposing hindi as a national language and the withdraw withdrawing of that step has obviously been sort of you know is seen as a big victory but again in the choice of languages and promoting multilingualism in a multilinguistic country of course that's uh, extremely applause worthy but how will the choice of languages happen where uh uh kancha ilaya when he talks about his own schooling experiences in andhra pradesh talks about growing up and hearing telugu but he says that what i heard the telugu what i what i what i read or what i heard in the classroom that telugu was not my telugu the gods that were being talked about were not the gods i knew the food and the habits that were being discussed were not the habits i knew now again so you know it's these are very nice buzzwords to sort of cite but how is this going to be executed who is going to be deciding across states and regions religions how is this going to happen and a very small example again of technology and the integration of technology we have hardly any in the pandemic through the pandemic any uh, a uh, sort of translation of basic curriculum courses into regional languages which were available online so again how is this going to materialize i mean i i will keep repeating that at the at the at the risk of sounding uh, you know uh, uh, yeah uh, technology in learning again like ma'am said what is technology and in learning presume certain things in place what is the internet penetration in our country out of in rural areas ma'am cited the figure of 23% um i i also sort of drew out some statistics and it says that out of 900 million rural users only 247 users have access to internet so with this sort of disconnect how are we looking at technology in learning implemented within technology we know we know from our schools in delhi uh, we know from the sort of places we've done field work in in a house if there is a phone and the the girl child and the boy have schooling who is the phone given to when there are parallel classes happening where is who is given the phone for learning now where does where do we account for this sort of thing where internet may be present but there is there are there are sort of intersectionalities of you know discrimination and marginalization that operate um the neb proposes the establishment of special education zones for socially socio and economically disadvantaged groups and this is where i would like to say that while the acknowledgement of the axes on which social disadvantage is noteworthy in the policy the very fact that it might just be a lip service comes clear within the document itself because it talks about clubbing different forms of socio economic disadvantage almost creating a competition 
within that 80% of who will garner the benefits in those zones. And also the very institutionalization of these zones as socioeconomically disadvantaged education zones creates another layer, I think which ma'am very rightly pointed out between the 20% and uh, extra constitutional category of you know, disadvantaged who are being churned out from these zones without which itself as, adds another layer of disadvantage rather than addressing or attending to it. The emphasis on vocational education, indeed extremely important. I heard all with all ears, Professor Dubey talked about um, Gandhiji's Nai Talim. And absolutely, I think there is no contestation of, you know, connecting the world of work, connecting the world of craft, of, you know, the knowledge that you tactically bodily produce through things like, uh, you know, basket weaving, working in the fields with knowledge. Yet again, the sort of way in which uh, vocational education is operationalized and concretized um, in the policy, it leaves, uh, it makes me fear on reading it that what will it do to the six-year-old child who is told that, okay, if you opt for vocational training, this might be the easiest way to get a job. It's almost like putting children belonging from socioeconomically disadvantaged families into the same silos and reproducing that same very disadvantage, but creating an illusion of choice. And to me, that is extremely uh, worrisome, extremely dangerous. Um, the policy is completely silent on the common school system. Uh, and I think there's been much said about resources, so I wouldn't repeat, but uh, again, it falls just as a lip service, public investment on education at 6% of the GDP, something that remains unchanged from the Kothari Commission. The education budget in the last three years has not gone beyond 3.1%. So even that sort of figure of 6% is not actualized in any way. Um, and I talked about two milestones. So one is the NEP which came and I think the second is a milestone that I don't know whether we can call it a milestone or a turning event that we all encountered in terms of the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. And one of the greatest uh, disasters again, other than the health uh, implications of COVID has been school closures leading to extreme form of learning setbacks and deficits and India has the longest period of school closures across the globe after Uganda. We had the longest period of school closures and reports that I sort of recently drew out from the internet point to the fact that 80% of students reported loss of learning levels uh, between 14 to 18 years. I think a lot has been spoken there's I don't have much to add in terms of uh, what uh, sir and ma'am have both already said. But in terms of intervention, I think that what uh, something that testifies to the importance of public education that has been constantly being highlighted and a long-term investment in public education and why that has no substitute, we don't need to look very far in terms of how Bhutan dealt with the pandemic. Now, the tiny nation of Bhutan had the lowest number of COVID deaths, which is just on a side note, they just had 21 deaths, but they also had the fastest record of school reopening, one of the fastest in the globe. And this is a country which is not particularly known for its economic prosperity. In fact, it's recently come out from the low income countries. This is a country which India was helping in creating education infrastructure in teachers training. And what the Bhutan example tells us is that is all the sort of things that I think this lecture highlights in terms of a responsive educational public policy, that what it needs goes much beyond uh, stopgap, ad hoc, declaratory statements, but a long-term vision 
of investment in public education, involvement of the community, because it was the volunteers who sort of, uh, you know, really upheld the system uh, through the tough COVID times and investment in basic education. And that has what allowed Bhutan to get on its feet and not have anywhere close to the sort of learning losses we have experienced with much less resources. So I would like to close on that note uh, by saying that to me, that stood out as a concrete example of a small nation, which has done everything that I think all our panelists are talking about. Uh, and I would like to stop there. Nope, I lost it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Barker. Um, by, by raising several questions on the national education policy, so some of which are widely talked about and some of which are not so widely talked about, uh, and the intricacies in those talks and those issues that were raised in the NEP. Uh, you have repeatedly referred to the technology. I think technology is a double-edged weapon, yeah. and its extensive reliance on education is certainly not found to be good by the educationists, by the other researchers, uh, even others will admit that, that extensive or complete reliance on technology would be really disastrous for a good education system anywhere in the world. Uh, well, you have raised several other important points and I will leave it to the uh, audience to react if there are any. Uh, now, may I request Professor Manish Jain to take the floor. Manish, you are here? Yes, sir, I am here. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. It's really uh, a late evening now. Uh, I I hope that uh, I stay within uh, my role as a discussant to uh, speak in ten minutes. And uh, let me also thank uh, uh, IMPRI and its CEO, Dr. Simi Mehta, for inviting me to this August panel, and I could listen to uh, Professor Dube, Professor Tilak, and my teacher, Professor Batra along with uh, my friend Bo, uh, him. Uh, being the last speaker is uh, an enviable and unenviable situation because many things that you want to say have already been said. So what should you say now? And secondly, it makes your task easier and difficult simultaneously that when centuries have been scored and uh, you have few runs to score, can you even score those? So let me try this and see uh, if, if I can even take a single. Uh, I'll play around. My background is political science and education. So uh, the title of today's uh, uh, discussion is State of School Education in India. And I'll play uh, with the word state in two ways. Uh, first is, what is the state that we witness and encounter when we look at the school education in India? So uh, instead of state as a situation, I am saying, how do we look at state when we look at the present situation? And my second question is, how do we view the relationship of state and school education in India in contemporary times with an awareness of historicity? Okay. So uh, as we know, uh, when uh, my teachers were speaking, I was reminded of Prem Chand's story, uh, Panch Parmeshwar. Uh, which has this iconic line, kya iman ke dar se, uh, kya bigar ke dar se iman ki baat na kahoge. And uh, when your teacher uh, from beard and teachers from distances, uh, in times when fear holds sway, uh, bigar ke dar ke baujud iman ki baat kehte hain, then you definitely get some strength. And it's with that uh, legacy, uh, learning from my teachers and tribute to them, uh, I begin. Uh, modern schooling and its colonial and post-colonial history, as Professor Nita Kumar has argued, have involved tussles over definitions of truth and meaning. Naming a problem is a political act as it signifies the virtuous and the dangerous. It defines the contours of the social world and constitutes people as subjects with particular kinds of aspirations, self-concepts, and fears. So when we are naming the problem as Professor Dube, Professor Tilak, and uh, him and uh, my teacher, Professor Batra, were, were doing, they were trying to help us think 
that what is the relationship between state education and people uh, which we are witnessing at the contemporary moment. And in this context, then the question, which is the first question which comes to us and which has also been asked repeatedly in the questions that are being posed, what is the state and what is the state now? What is its historicity as uh, Professor Batra and Professor Dubey were pointing out from colonial times to earlier years of independence, post 1990s and now. So on the one hand, we find certain continuities in terms of inequities, in terms of uh, little resource mobilization. But at the same time, as Professor Dubey uh, in his uh, eloquent presentation pointed out how there has been significant shift in resource allocation. But I don't want to reduce the question of education to resource allocation. I want to bring the question and reiterate what Professor Batra said. She said that we are reducing education to learning. And I want to reiterate that with some addition. So education is about a purpose. Education is about an imagination. Education is about aims. Education is more than schooling. Schooling is more than learning. Learning is more than learning outcomes. So when in the contemporary discourse, we reduce education to learning outcomes, the, uh, the narrowness and reductionism which is at work would be worth pointing out when we are discussing the state of school education. Dr. Mehta, uh, who has organized this discussion in the very beginning, she used two terms, school effectiveness, uh, and uh, there was one more word she used. And I was wondering that here is a scholar uh, who on the one hand is concerned about education in contemporary India, and she has organized this discussion. But when she herself talks, begins conversation about education, and please don't treat it as a personal comment, it tells us what Professor Batra was saying, how, what is the discourse which is coming to shape our educational imagination? Okay. So in this school effectiveness is not in terms of purposes of making citizens who are critical and open, who are democratic and simultaneously national, Rather, this school effectiveness has a narrow conception of performance, of accountability, of efficiency, of learning outcomes, which themselves, as Professor Tilak will teach us, which comes from a human capital model, which is very narrow, which reduces human being to a homo economicus and that to human, homo economicus of capitalism and inequality. So that's the second thing when, which we need to take note of when we are talking about this. The third thing which we need to take note of is that in contemporary times, new discourses of new public management, accountability, efficiency, public-private partnership about which Professor Dubey and Professor Tilak and Ma'am talked about, they have both global roots and domestic support. So they are reimagining the responsibilities and ideas of state, public education and citizenship. So when we are talking about education, we can't leave out these questions. Fourth thing, because I have just 10 minutes, so uh, I have to score fast. The fourth thing which we need to take note of is, and which uh, was indirectly mentioned, there is a very big elephant in the state of education at present. Ma'am referred to it through reference to Ekal Vidyalayas, that is Vidya Bharati. The biggest network, non-state network, run by Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, with lakhs of students and teachers and thousands of schools, running from private middle class localities to Adivasi localities, pursuing an agenda which is simultaneously ideological and sectarian. So, not simply talking about state or talking about the private, without taking note of this differentiation within the private, uh, I think we would miss something and our discussion should take note of that as well. Here, uh, I wish to draw your attention to the Paach Pran, which our Honorable Prime Minister spoke of in his uh, 15th uh, August speech from the rampart of Red Fort. And the second and third, as Indian Express reports, is removing colonial mindset and taking pride in roots. 
a country which has a colonial legacy it obviously in terms of decolonization would need to think about removing the colonial mindset and dependence on the western hegemony and theories and taking pride in culture these are the things which even the 1953 uh, uh, commission on secondary education also talked about but there the question of colonialism was seen not simply in terms of binaries what we need to recognize and i'm underlining this point that this is a question which is which is often ignored in our discussion of national education policy 2020 and in the discussions which are happening around curriculum that how the idea of decolonization is being mobilized in a certain nationalist chauvinistic uh, agenda whereby certain citizens themselves are not classified as authentic indigenous and the mobilization of the post-colonial theory and categories of speaking against western hegemony is being mobilized along with anxieties about families culture caste in a period of decolonization to uh, underscore a certain hegemony so when we are talking about state of school education it cannot be simply about provisioning and infrastructure alone it also needs to take off what is the imagination of nation society and people that we wish to constitute through education here uh, please also allow me uh, to quote my dear friend uh, nandini manjrekar who asked this question to us and i quote her what is the larger political economy of education within which educated women are seeking jobs in the school sector she says further how have reforms reconfigured the social and economic character of schools the school as a workplace and social relations within schooling systems how are these discourses gendered what are the new relations between education family and gender that are impacting the lives of women teachers so when ma'am asked the question of feminization and somebody in the questions asked about that increasing education of women along with low work participation we need to constantly ask situate education with reference to not only political economy but also the intersecting vectors of gender caste class and regions uh next thing which i wish to draw our attention to uh is the question of uh this pandemic pedagogies uh, the question of limited digital access was raised by Dr. Borker. But I also wish to ask a few questions to us. Because the question is not simply that if, if everybody can have access. My question goes beyond it. Even if everybody has access, then what? So these, pedag these pandemic pedagogies were mediated through technological interventions by edu businesses, video conferences, companies and tech giants like Google and Microsoft emerging as financial winners of the pandemic with significant growth in investment and valuation these players also dominated the imagination of education during the pandemic through their products and services at such time the questions that we need to ask is that how are private actors becoming increasingly embedded in the education system and what is the role of the state and the policy networks that have taken shape during the pandemic? So we need to look at what ma'am and Professor Dubey were pointing out to both the continuities from the present and also the ruptures. Uh, I'll just end uh, uh, with a uh, last thing which I wish to say is that the question of special education zones which is being positioned in uh, in in NEP, uh, what what does that mean? And along with that, the question of volunteerism, uh, which was raised earlier. So in in a uh, recent paper, uh, I along with a friend have written around the idea of local. So what are the various ways in which the idea of local community and volunteerism are being mobilized at a time when historically we saw that the whole idea of para-teacher and volunteerism came, whereby state was withdrawing from education, structural adjustment pro program of the World Bank was being given, 
and the idea was that we cannot stress state rather the social capital not in the bourdieu sense but in the sense of social links and networks to replace the state and to uh, pitch in in place of the withdrawing state whereby one citizen will help another so how does one take note of even these changes should come in our conversation about the state of education in india uh, thank you very much i'll stop here thank you very much manish <clears throat> for your quick uh quick half a dozen points that you raised very very critically uh, particularly raising the fundamental question on the relationship between education and the state uh historically our understanding is much different but the contemporary experience is showing something different completely with which we have problems it is not only the relationship i think the nature of the state itself is changing the nature of education is changing of course when both are changing the relationship between the two is also changing uh, very very drastically while in a dynamic world that happens but i think the change the direction of the change is something very very some uh in case of all the three our understanding of education is also changing we define redefine uh, not only curriculum and pedagogy the very purpose of education is being redefined in a different way so there are several questions of that kind that come up and uh, thank you for highlighting some of these important issues now we are uh, the, the actual time schedule provides for some questions from the floor which are listed in the q and a and uh, three or four or five of them that i could read earlier were there but if uh, anybody wants to raise any other one or two important questions we can take up from the floor from the audience <clears throat> Are the organizers around, Simi? Simi Mehta? Yes, 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 sir. Okay, yes, you are sir. around. We yes, yes. Go, we can go a little bit uh, for a few minutes, five, ten minutes or so. Or... Simi Mehta, I'm asking, can we go for another five to ten minutes? Yes, certainly, sure. sir. Certainly, please. Okay, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, if there are any questions from the audience uh, they would like to say, certainly I have not read all the questions. I have not uh, reproduced, of course, all. Any questions uh, they want to raise critically on any of the presentations, but do not expect. Professor Guman, would you like to? Answers. Professor Guman, would you like to speak? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Yes. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, it was really a treat to listen, Professor Dubbe Yevi Tilk, my friend. I have met him several times, and uh, critical. analysis of the new economic policy in the context of state of school education in india uh i have raised uh, as professor tilk has already said a number of questions earlier uh my fundamental question still remains is that uh, to particularly professor tilk and professor dobe and maybe other panelists how can we expect uh, inclusion while state is bent upon exclusion number 1 how can we expect uh, that our educational system must enable and empower the students to raise articulate and raise questions when the state is not giving space to raise questions already you have seen a number of intellectuals behind the bar just for raising questions so i would like to have your comments on this that this incompatibility what we expect from educational system and what is the state doing it and third is that we are talking about inclusion the ugc has already disbanded a number of in exclusion study centers which means na rahega bans na bajegi bansri ki you don't allow to create data you don't allow to public data even government itself is not public public uh, publishing most of its data uh, consumer expenditure is one unemployment data is another and many others and change of nso to uh, this uh, uh, labor pl 
this uh, labor data statistics so my fundamental concern is that education is in line with the government agenda and political dispensation which is at present and is continuing the same agenda with a more vigor which was adopted in 1991 so if uh, you can help me in uh, solving this question i would be very happy thank you thank you sir <laughs> professor tela could you like to complete no, some we'll other questions we will take one or two more questions and yes. then Yes. I thought of the question, Professor. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Would you like to ask your question? Okay, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am, and good evening to all. Uh, my question is: Can we ensure that after education, uh, all may be given some uh, jobs or uh, some source of earning? No, they can give you answer. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Rukmini, ma'am, would you like to ask your question? Rukmini, ma'am, you could unmute and uh, you could ask your question. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, ma'am. Please go ahead. So my, my, I already shared my, one of my questions in the chat box. Uh, I, my question was that, as somebody said, that it's uh, the state, um, you know, when you use words, any kind of words, or you produce a document, you are also uh, uh, creating an imaginative landscape. So my question was to do with the creation of that imaginative landscape. And I asked my question in response to some research that we were doing in, uh, in connection with some research that we were doing at IIT Delhi. And when we looked at the, when I looked at the NEP document, I found that the word failure or fail was not mentioned even once, not even once. Yet we know that failure and failing is an important and haunting psychological theme in our in social growth, in questions of equity and so on. So one way to look at the, any, the imagination of the NEP document, and this is a very small pinpoint, uh, is, uh, you know, they were being very empathetic. They didn't really want to point to the notion of failure. Uh, the other thing is that they were not addressing it at all. You know, that people fear failure. That is one of the many fears that we have in an unequal polity. So my question was, what is your, that is, that, that's really not my question, but it is one way of entering the discourse of N NEP. And it is to do with why Failure is such a feared concept within the NEP document that it is not mentioned at all. So that's one question, and I can talk uh, more, but this is a simple question. And if any of the panelists have any answers, I would be very interested because I'm completing a book on education at the moment. Thank you. Professor Tillet, can we have one more question? There is a very interesting question by an anonymous attendee. Okay, to, uh, yeah. okay sir. So, uh, it says that there are no dearth of different types of school in our country. Kendriya Vidyalaya, Jawahar Navodaya, <coughs> run, municipal run, private schools vary in capacity and results. Community targeted schools like Eklavya residential schools. The goal to have universal quality education gets mm -hmm. distributed and accountability disappears when there are many implementing authorities. Is there a need to rationalize these or is it better to follow through and increase mm -hmm. types of schools? Mm -hmm. And also uh, another question um, which has been um, uh, quite bothering to me is about the midday meals in the school. Uh, there are a few scholars who have been very critical about it. And I would like to know the views mm -hmm. of Professor Dubey on this. 
because uh, the the entire system is more concerned about uh, food quality and what to be prepared uh, food and nutrition security etc which is extremely important but the teaching takes the back burner so i would like to know um, professor dubey's views on this about its continuation and its efficacy thank you yeah. so perhaps we can request dr dubey to take uh, the floor and uh, respond to some of these important issues in fact he touched some of these issues already in his presentation but you might like to elaborate uh, in response to the questions where it raised, whether it is KVS, whether it is midday meals, whether it is differential kinds of systems of school, or any other issue that was raised. Dr. Dubey? I, I shall start uh, from the last question. And uh, I am strongly in favor of uh, the continuation of the midday meals not only continuation, but uh, its extension, both upward and downward. If uh, pre-primary two, three years are included, and if the secondary education is included. Because if that is not done, then in the same premises, you would have some students who will get their midday meals, and other students who would not get midday meals. Uh, so, I think that empirical data has uh, uh, more than demonstrated that uh, a large number of the children go to school attracted by this thing, uh, which has led to an increase in the GR enrollment uh, ratio. Uh, also that uh, a large number of our children mm -hmm. are malnutritioned and uh, uh, you know, there's a relationship between the capacity to learn and the nutrition that you have. And these are the children of the poorest uh, category of uh, families. And therefore, uh, it is a great source of uh, help to them. Uh, and from all this point of view, it is a must, not only whether one is favor or not. Now, you, this, one who asked the question started by saying that uh, there are many people against it. I think in our country or perhaps in other countries also, there is hardly anything <laughs> regarding which there would not be some people speaking against. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that is not a criteria for changing the whole, the whole policy. Policy depends upon a full calculated analysis of the pros and cons and the advantage and balance. Uh, this is the uh, main thing. Other thing also is that uh, general accept acceptability of the policy. So not who is criticizing and not who is not criticizing. I mean, after the new government come to power, poor emerging has come in for a lot of criticism from all sources. What till the central was, uh, you know, eulogized for his uh, a remarkable extraordinary contribution to social sciences. So the criticism one has faced in life from many quarters and one has dealt with it. And this is what should be done regarding this. Now, many kinds of school, if you would have noticed, I've said in my statement that uh, when I was doing the common school system commission report on uh, work in Bihar, we came across a bewildering variety of schools in Bihar. And I mentioned 13 categories. And one of our first recommendations to be able to suggest establishment of common school system was to reduce these 13 categories into three categories, which is based on rationality of providing education and not uh, how they originated. Uh, so number must be reduced rather than being further proliferated. There is no doubt about that. If you, if you really want to have a move towards a common school system. Now, <clears throat> failure. I think uh, uh, nobody uh, insisted that NEP should use the term failure. And it is a, a deficient document because it doesn't use the term failure. 
but it is also a fact of life that you can't move forward until you recognize where you have failed, where you have not succeeded. And uh, no government document does that. It does it uh, stiltily, with tongue in cheek, with uh, <laughs> lots of qualification. And the result is that it is never able to come forward with uh, a solution which is truly viable and truly conducive to serving public interest. So, um, I mean, somebody defined failure as failure is not falling down, but you know, standing up after you have fallen. That is a real failure. So the failure should be mentioned, our, our deficiency should be mentioned. Without that, we would have no incentive to correct ourselves. This is a kind of a moral argument. Now, I would like to uh, 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 can you assure that after education, you can get a job? We can never assure that. And we have said that, and uh, uh, Dr. Bhatta has made it clear in so many words, that education is not for providing jobs. Education is for building an individual, bringing out the best in him, enabling him to face this uh, difficult world, making him enable him to make a distinction between the right and the wrong, between uh, what is desirable and what is patently undesirable. And uh, uh, apart from, you know, kind of learning, so-called so learning. And uh, uh, this definition of education uh, is not uh, made in any of the documents, I would say, not even the RT Act implicitly there are references to that, but not clearly, as it is done in the Delaware Commission report that was done in 1999, and it was education in the 20th century, commissioned by the UNESCO. And uh, that document is basically valid and relevant to the conditions prevailing in the developed world, because the problem in developing world is entirely different. But ultimately, you have to come to the meaning of education. And meaning of education, in a way, is very well summed up in the Delove Commission report. It is to learn to do, to learn to know, to learn to live with others. Uh, so uh, now one last point that uh, I want to uh, refer to or comment on is by Manish, and it is a uh, uh, you know, an attempt uh, that uh, action at the local level should replace state. Now, I don't know who carried out this experiment uh, on a systematic basis. And if there's any instance uh, in the world where uh, local level initiative by the community has replaced uh, the state. Uh, I'm sorry in our inf imperfect system, the state is uh, still indispensable in spite of all the wrongs that it has done, in spite of all the vices that it has committed. And uh, uh, we are far, far from building a movement at the local level which can replace the state. It is the reality, whether ideally it is uh, desirable or not, that's a different matter. That can be further argued. And there I would not take the categorical view. Uh, so these are my brief com comments. <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I completely agree with the point that, the last point particularly. I, I also feel that no one, no major actor of whatever, whatever however big or small, can replace the state in any in any state, in a particularly in a welfare state, in a developmental state, whether it is a market, whether it is a local, whether it is global forces, uh, however powerful they are, or however well intended they are, 
I think the state is something which is very pious and uh, if it's not doing very well, then state has to be reformed, but state cannot be replaced at any point, at any point of time. And uh, one can complement and one can supplement the efforts of the state, but I think any attempt to replace it would be really, dis will be really disastrous. Unfortunately, that is what the private sector is doing in education, displacing the state completely from the education sector and taking control of the education. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, Manish has already left because he has a meeting. Manish, I think you are not there. Uh, now I'd uh, ask Professor Poonam and Poonam Batra or Dr. M. Baker to say any one-line statements at the end if they want to say anything uh, uh, now. Poonam, are you there? No, I guess they, she, they also left. Dr. Barker is here. Sorry? Dr. Hem Borkar is here, ma'am, please. Hem Borkar is there. Yeah. Would you like to say anything, Professor Baker? Baker. Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I think I've said what I wanted to say, but I, I probably uh, just as a closing line, I think what sums up uh, at least my take on the state of education is that, um, uh, yes, quality education is the mantra, but there is quality education equals inclusive education. So there is no quality without inclusivity. I agree. Good. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, well, we have an excellent long session in, in which we have learned, unlearned, and relearned several aspects relating to the educational policies uh, in India, and also historically, and also in the contemporary situation. And I think all of us uh, who are here uh, online or otherwise uh, really feel benefited. Uh, by the rich presentations that are made, particularly Professor Dubey's uh, presentation and also by the common experts of opinions, the panelists, Professor Poonam Badra, Hamburger, and Manish Jain. So on behalf of all and on my personal behalf, I would like to thank Professor Dubey you know, for an excellent presentation and the panelists for their very, very uh, useful interventions. And I would also like to thank many of the questions that were raised in the question and answer floor. But unfortunately, we don't have a really long time you know, to have extensive discussions uh, uh, from the audience. And I would also like to thank the Yumpri team, Dr. Ajit Kumar, Simi Mehta, and others for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Simi, it's over to you now. Thank you so much, sir. Would you like to make your final comments on the... No, I think, uh, I, uh, as I said, the final you? comment should come from uh, Professor Dubey and conclude? it has come. Yeah, we can conclude, yeah. We can conclude it, uh, uh, Dr. Mehta. Right, so to formally give the vote of thanks, now let me conclude. So, yes, okay, okay. Professor Dubey can, yes, okay, okay. Right, so thank you everyone for joining in. And as we come to this uh, extremely enlightening- Yes, uh, Arjun, over. We would formally like to thank from uh, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute to all of you and special gratitude to our uh, chair, uh, Professor Tilak and our keynote speaker, Professor Muchpandibre. Uh, we would also like to thank all of our discussant, Professor Poonam Batra, Dr. Himborkar and Dr. Manish Jain. Thank you for adding all of your uh, diverse perspective and valuable insights to this deliberation. Uh, we are also thankful to all the participants who joined us and raised such a pertinent questions for making this so enriching. And we are grateful to you if you are watching us later on uh, Facebook, YouTube, or listening to our podcast or reading to our publication. Thank you once again. And we hope that in future also you will be joining our uh, web policy talks. Thank you. And I wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the best. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Beep, beep.